Hi, everyone. My name is Ian Fales. I'm from beforesandafters.com and welcome to this special Rebel Way webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce Sabre Jalassi, who's the co-founder and CEO of Rebel Way. Hi, Sabre. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you, Ian? Great. It's great to see you. You're thank also you. the instructor of Intro to Houdini Effects at Rebel Way, yes. which is what we're going to talk about today. I'm very excited to hear from you about it and to learn more about the kind of things that are going to be covered in the course. Thank um, you. Say, but do you want to give a brief background about actually who you are and what Rebel Way is? Absolutely. So um, I'm a visual effects artist. I have uh, more than 15 years of experience and uh, I did all kinds of uh, uh, VFX tasks and started off in Archviz about 15 years ago uh, doing uh, rendering in, in V-Ray and Maya and 3ds Max. And then I moved on to commercials to work for MPC London. And then uh, slowly migrated into film to do effects and uh, uh, lighting as well as compositing. And then um, I then moved to the US. I was in London. I moved to the US and uh, worked for Blizzard for about five years where I did a variety of things. I worked as a basically a generalist TD where I did pipeline developments for uh, Nuke, Maya, uh, helped integrate Redshift as well as uh, various tools and effects work. And then uh, after, during that same time as well, I was doing a lot of freelancing uh, for effects and lighting. And uh, the last five years I've uh, decided to start Webway and focus more on teaching. Uh, the initial plan was for me to transition into freelancing, but then Webway grew very quickly. So I took it more seriously and now uh, we have Rebel Way and it's my full-time job and I teach and I run it at the same time. Yeah. What, what's really cool is that I feel like Rebel Way has become this go-to place to learn about Houdini, but also I see it pop up everywhere. You know, I'll be searching something on YouTube and there it'll be, or it's a, there's someone will link to it on LinkedIn or there'll be some sort of Rebel Way portion on um, Twitter. So I love that um, people are really responding to it and seeing it around the web too. That, that must be kind of very gratifying. It is very cool. Yeah, it's it's very cool. We I started off very very small, but then uh, it quickly grew and people liked what was uh, I was doing with Igor and Igor is is an amazing uh, artist as well. And uh, we started off slowly, and then things get picked up, and we got a lot of students uh, at first who are really good uh, with what they have done, and that their work showed and quickly uh, helped us, you know, get high up uh, the level. So our students reel is, is comparable to the best schools right now, like Norman and Scape and, uh, you know, School Boy, uh, Lost Boys and many other schools. And uh, yeah, it's very cool. Proud of it. Yeah, awesome. So what we're going to do today is Sabre's going to give a presentation, um, which will, of course, cover what's in intro to Houdini FX. But I think you're also going to talk about some general topics Absolutely. to do with the visual effects industry. Absolutely. So I want to provide guidance to anybody who is either starting a, an effects journey or transitioning into Houdini or really or interested in getting into this field, what it looks like, what we do, how we do it, and basically talk about uh, why Houdini and how we're going to help you learn it if you're interested in that. So it's more than just the workshop and what we're going to teach and and but rather how houdini works what effects artists do and how you can get started if you're interested in that and then we're going to dive deeper uh, uh we're going to dive deeper into the content and how i designed it what's the goal of it and really how how it's going to help people if they're serious about learning effects mm. and becoming a, a, an effects artist awesome um also everyone stick around um at the end because uh, the Rebel Way guys asked the internet for some questions and we're going to have a Q&A um, uh, at the end. But I'm also going to stick around during the webinar and ask Saber some curly questions um, that he might answer. Um, so Saber, why don't you jump into that presentation now? Absolutely. Let's get started. Let's get started. So welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the Introduction to Houdini for FX presentation. Uh, it's an overview of the FX creation and what FX artist has to know if they are uh, interested in becoming an FX artist or transitioning from other application into Houdini, uh, whether it's Maya or any other 3D software. 
and uh, or you want to dive more into Houdini. It is also uh, geared towards a beginner who wants to take it to the next level and do more advanced topics and build their reel uh, that hopefully will help them uh, land the job. So this is, it's playing on the background is the preview or the promo trailer from the uh, introduction to Houdini for effects. This is part our, of the content that we will teach uh, during the 10 weeks, maybe a bit more than 10 weeks. And then I have some new stuff that I'm also going to be talking about uh, that I'll, I will show in details. And uh, the promo will show a variety of effects using particles, volumes, water simulation, destruction, and how to composite uh, all of this and, and build a final image. And uh, all right, so first of all, I want to talk and clarify and demystify what effects artists do. What is it that we create? What is it? What do we do in our you know day-to-day -day job? We have five things, five types of effects the exist pretty much there's destruction there's smoke related effects there's water cloth and soft body magical and abstract effects anything you do is going to fall into one of these types destruction is where you take a building or uh, uh, you have a ground you need to crack it to create an earthquake or something that falls into destruction smoke effects is anything that is smoke related can be cloud, uh, a fly through cloud, it can be um, uh, an explosion, it can be a dry ice effect, it can be a, a burnout, a tire burnout, or anything that is volumetric that either requires a sim or not. Next is water effects, anything that is liquid, uh, it is water related, small scale or large scale, it's a whale jump or you know part of the Caribbean, anything water related falls into that. Then we have cloth and soft body. So this is really expanding now because Houdini has more and more features being added into it and recently vellum and more muscle uh, and tissue simulators. So it's been used for cloth, muscle and uh, anything that is soft body really. And then magical effects, this is not um, a solver specific, this is really visual specific. So it can be done with uh, using uh, smoke sims or destruction or same tools as uh, particle sims. And, um, but the visual at the end that you create is abstract. So you can think Dr. Strange for, for instance. Um, Sabra, I love that overview. I'll tell you why. Because I reckon a lot of people I talk to think that these kind of effects are only in big Marvel productions or, you know, huge Star Wars films, but in fact, they've made their way into just about any kind of film or TV show and animated feature now, haven't they? Absolutely. This The demand is so insane for this work, and it's everywhere. Documentaries, TV show, mm. commercials, game cinematics, uh, real time, and then you have, of course, the AAA movies and uh, Avengers and Marvel movies. So it's being used everywhere. Everything needs these special effects. They are unique and they are required pretty much uh, to uh, help build the visual of any any media, any medium. Yeah, totally. Right, next. So this is, a, this is an overview of what we do. And then the effects creation process. So, okay, we, we have destruction, we have water, we have all this. What is it? What is it that we have? What kind of data do we have that we can use to create this what is it that we work with? It's very simple. We have three things. Uh, in modeling, for example, they have only geometry. They have primitives or polygons that they can work with. When it comes to effects, we have more than that. We have geometry. It can be used to create things like destruction. We have points, and this uh, we call it points, but it's really a particle if you're coming from other 3D softwares. In Houdini, it's called uh, points, and uh, it's used to create uh, particle sims, it's used to create water sims, and many, many other things that I'll demo in more details in a sec. Then we have voxels. Voxels, this is a volumetric data that can be used to represent cloud or any smoke uh, type effects. And the potential, this is the data that we have. This is what is available for you as an effects artist. And the trick is to master manipulating and sculpting this data. So like if you are a, a sculptor in ZBrush, you know how to take a sphere and make a human head off of it. You, you, you can sculpt the data, you have direct access, you have an idea, you can execute that. With Houdini, it's different. You don't have hands-on tools. You have to process all this either through sims 
or through nodes. So it's not direct operation on the data, but it's rather a process that will uh, give you mastery over controlling that data, whether it's geometry points or, or voxel. And a lot of things uh, that we do is animated. So 95% of the effects work is going to be animation. And it's really rare to do effects on um, that is still, that doesn't move. So that's another factor. Right, so we're going to dive into a geometry, uh, into more detail. So what does geometry in effects uh, can help us achieve? And uh, here's a few, few things. Uh, geometry can help us create rigid body, destruction, um, um, uh, sims, for example, it can help us create cloth. So we take a cloth, we sim it, that is a cloth effect. It can also create hair and water. So this water surface here is an actual uh, surface mesh that is being rendered as water. And I have this uh, video here. So this is a preview of what geometry will look like in the render. So this is a destruction of a cliff, uh, of a, uh, a tunnel collapsing. And this is all done through geometry. There's smoke effects on top, but this is geometry. It can also help you create abstract effects that are not in that are very unique in terms of visual. So this is all done rendered as geometry. It's meshed, but it's done through a complex process that we'll talk about uh, in a bit. It can also be used to create a, a large amount of points if you want to sim uh, this kind of effects. Here, I, I tried to recreate the Hobbit. Uh, scene with the dragon uh, under the coins. And then we have a water uh, simulation here that is meshed and rendered as water. So this is what geometry data uh, can help you create in effects. This is what you can do with it. Next is points. And uh, points is very, very uh, powerful tool in effects. It's one, it's probably the most amount of, uh, it's the most data that you're gonna be spending time with working as a an effects artist. The more you know about Houdini or just points in general, the better effects artist you're gonna become. The, you can create magical effects, you can create white water, you can create abstract effects just using points. All these effects are created uh, through different workflows, but they are represented as points. And these points are rendered and they look in various different ways. You can make them look abstract, you can create some uh, uh, magical effects, you can re uh, create realistic effects like water sims here, some energy uh, ball moving through a, um, a ground with another energy or another particle effects. This is a preview uh, view of what the data looks like in the Houdini view, uh, viewport preview. Uh, this is an effect similar to Diablo 3 wings effects that uh, I'm trying to recreate and it's part of the training. And this is how they can look like in the view, in the render. So once you're done processing and working with all these point data, you can create this type of visual at the end. So uh, this is one example of that uh, being rendered in Houdini and composited in uh, in Nuke. And then so, have... Saber, it, it occurs to me something really interesting that also some people don't always know. They often think of Houdini um, as just for, say, huge film projects, like we said. But of course, it's across so many different mediums too, as in game creation, um, and, you know, even interactive experiences right now. So Absolutely. you mentioned the Diablo effect, but it, it, has that been your observation too, that it, it, it's now sort of in so many different areas? Yes, absolutely. So Houdini is really a, a, a tool that you can use to process data. And that mm. data or that processing or those tasks is required in many, many different fields. And the more people know about Houdini, the more they are aware of its tools and its capability. And I'm going to show later some unique ways of how Houdini tools can be used in different ways to be repurposed and create something unique. So the more people use Houdini, the more creativity we're going to see of what they can achieve with it, because the potential is just uh, uh, insane. Honestly, there's no no limit, and it it gives you access. Like I said, it, when you're sculpting with ZBrush, you have total control. Houdini gives you total control of your data. In this case, it's not polygons; it's points or voxels. And once you have that control, you can use it to create any uh, anything really. All right. Fantastic. So that's uh, about geometry and points. And then next thing is voxel. So this is another big, big uh, uh, data type that you're gonna be spending a lot of time with and really understanding what each of these uh, of this data can 
create. This is a preview of what volumetric data or smoke effects can look like. So I have a fire here, I have an explosion uh, effects, and then here are some more explosion effects with the spaceship going through. This is magical effects with some, again, magical uh, smoke effects. And uh, this is a different scene of a dust storm. Here's some more explosion effects. It's generally associated with smoke uh, and, and cloud, but in this case, for example, it's it being used to create a sci-fi uh, effect or an abstract effect. Um, yeah, this is volumetric data and how it can be used in Houdini. So really that's what effects artists do in Houdini. All Houdini uh, uh, is offering is total control of this data, whether it's through SIM or not. So you don't have to always run SIM. For example, in the case of cloud, that can be done without any, any simulation, uh, for instance. So then we have a two, two things. We have the simulation or the creation process, then the rendering workflow. So for example, you can be working in Houdini and you have a, a surface data, a geometry data. That representation in the viewport is not the end of it. You can have data that looks like a geometry, but then when you send it to the render, you can tell it, I wanna treat the surface as volumetric. And the result of that, you can use it to create magical effects. And uh, understanding at a deep level, this these possibility is very, very crucial to becoming a, a, an effects artist because you have to know this is the tools you have. You have to know that what you see in the viewport or what you see in Houdini is not necessarily what you're gonna get in the end. And I have a quick example here of uh, geometry being manipulated in Houdini. So this is, I create a, a few cards and I'm gonna show how that, that geometry can be converted into volume to look like a volumetric data and or like an abstract effects. So geometry does not mean that you are stuck with polygons uh, in Houdini. It can, it can mean many, many other things. And the more you know about this, the more you understand about this, the better uh, when becoming an effects artist. So this is one tricky aspect of Houdini uh, really in becoming an effects artist. So that's what's geometry. Next is points. So we have points, right? We can make them look like hard surfaces. We can make them look like spheres at render time. We can make, we can also tell that's what we have in the scene. We have points. Well, when you send it to the render, we can tell it, I want these points to look like spheres, or I, I want to make them look like disks, or I want you to treat them like a volumetric. I want to make it as if this data is volumes, or you can give them a transparent or a Fresnel look to make them look like magic. So what you have in the scene is not necessarily what you're going to get in the render. And this is a quick preview of uh, using points in Houdini. So here I created a grid with some points and I'm copying a sphere to them and it can make them look like a hard surface or just fill it with points. So that's one type. Uh, the other use case is you can create points, many, many points and make them look, uh, give them some transparency and get that additive uh, magical look. So what you have in Houdini in terms of data can look in many different ways in the render. And this part is also very, very crucial. And same thing with voxels. So voxels or volumetric data, generally associated with explosions, fire, but it can create magical effects like you see here. Or it can be used to create hard surfaces or abstract hard surfaces, things that typically you can think of, like how would I convert a volumetric data into a surface? But there's use cases. You can use this to create bubbles under the water. You can sim volumetric data or an actual smoke sim under uh, an actual smoke sim and convert it into a surface and that will give you a bubble effect. So knowing all of these things is very, very crucial. So this is a volumetric data in Houdini viewport. This is a guy running and uh, uh, emitting fire. That same volumetric data is then converted into a geometry and I can use this in, in Maya or any other uh, software. And then that same volumetric data can be tweaked to look magical, uh, to have you know certain uh, feel and different look, it's not necessarily fire. And this is an example of what smoke effects or fire will look like. And this is a rendered version of the uh, storm effects uh, guy I'm calling him. This is created by an artist, uh, his name is Saryut. And then Igor and I spent some time to add a few layers to it. And then we're gonna spend some time uh, working on it and we'll release it soon. It's gonna be a, our next free tutorial, hopefully. All right. I love that. 
Saber, I wanted to ask you about something that often comes up when I um, talk to visual effects supervisors and even Houdini effects artists. They always talk about the strength of Houdini as its procedural approach to effects. And, you know, that also works for lighting and um, other things, rendering simulation. But for someone who's not really familiar with what that means, could you could you give a quick, you know, overview of what it means that Houdini is procedural? Absolutely. Nature? Absolutely. So let's say you have uh, 100 points, exactly 100 points. You want to affect half of them. In Maya or other softwares, other 3D softwares, you have to select those 50 points, right? So you build your selection and then take those 50 points, add maybe some noise deformer or something specific to that selection. So that system is tied into the selection or the initial input, right? If you change the input, the system breaks. And so with Houdini, when you have a large amount of data, because the way it access and, it and allows you to control the data, you don't need to select 50 points. You can tell it, I want to select all the points that are living inside this bounding box. And that bounding box is covering or selecting whatever is available in, in, those, in that area. That feeds into your system, whether it's adding noise or anything. So that procedural of not being tied to the incoming data is very important. I can build a system that takes a line, add a noise to it. If I change that line to be a curve, curve has also points, right? Or I can change it to be a grid. Grid has also points. So as long as the same amount of data exists, Houdini system will work. And that's the proceduralism aspect. It's just you're building systems that are not tied to the incoming data and they are generic. And so swapping the input is, is really easy. Um, so that's why, for example, if you have a character emitting fire like that uh, guy walking, if the animation changes, it's not based off a mm. specific selection of the arms or specific selection of the vertices. It's driven via procedural noise. So the noise is generated based on the mesh. And so if they change the animation or change the mesh, my system is going to work. And this is a crucial part of effects. Yeah. And of course, in a production environment, changes are so common <laughs> yes. right up to the last minute. Absolutely. And it always feels like Houdini suits that kind of change, you know, change requests from the director or whatever it is. Absolutely. And can accommodate that. Yeah, yeah, that flexibility is, is crucial. And uh, be because the, the data that I'm talking about here, uh, it's very tricky to access it. Let's say you have voxels. How are you going to access them? How are you going to control them? You have to have a system that is procedural that just works with whatever you have incoming. And that's the power of Houdini, really. Next on is uh, so simulation and rendering workflow. So what is this all about Houdini? What What is it that Houdini offers that, that we're going to learn or use it offers three things that's it we're going to learn three sections we're going to learn sops this is anything that is a surface operator and it's not simulation it's not it's not time dependent it it's, it does not require simulation and this for example you have a building you want to shatter that building you want to fracture it into smaller pieces or you have a you you take a, a, a grid or a plane and you want to make a height field you want to make a mountain off of it all of that uh, all of that processing is done in soft so anything that is directly manipulating the points or the data uh, primitives or polygon that is not time dependent that it does not require simulation this is where most of the time is going to be spent. Then we have the dynamic operators. So this is where you prep something in, in, in SOPS. You have a character coming from Maya. You convert that into a volume, and then you use that volume to emit smoke. Or you take that uh, uh, geometry and you convert it into uh, particles and use that to emit particles. All that smoke and particle simulation is going to be done in dynamic operators. This includes anything cloth, uh, uh, grain sims, uh, smoke sims, explosions, anything that it that requires sim, water simulation, flip fluid, all of that is done in DOP. So we're going to focus on understanding how this uh, system works, how the data flows in that, and how to control it, and how to use the various uh, solvers available, and this is what side effects offers. Then we have, once you finish you know, prepping the data in SOPs and running the sims in DOPs, you import them, and you render them 
using the ROPS, which is the rendering operator. So this can be Mantra or Karma or Redshift or Arnold, anything, just taking that data and plugging into the render. And this is what Houdini is all about, SOPS, DOPS, and ROPS. And you get data, you prep it, you sim it, and then you render that, uh, that data. So next thing is data handling for simulation and rendering. So this is very uh, important topic. Uh, I, I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions, but CPU uh, defines how slow the render or the sim is going to be. Okay, so if you have a 10 years old CPU, the sim is going to take 20 hours. If you have a newer CPU, the sim is going to take eight hours. What is the factor that will decide whether you can run that SIM on that CPU is the amount of memory, not the time. I can run a SIM uh, on a very old CPU that is 10, exactly 10 years old. It would take me 40 hours, but what will allow me to do it is actually the memory. So the more memory you have, the more data you can fit in. The more data you can fit in, points or volumes or whatever, the higher or the more complex the visual is going to be. So the more memory you have, 16, 32, 64, or plus the more data you're gonna handle. As for the CPU, it's only going to affect the SIM time and the, uh, uh, and the render time. It's not gonna affect how much data you can render or how much data you're gonna SIM. So uh, really you have to have enough memory to fit in the data or the amount of data that you need. And then the CPU is gonna simply decide how fast that task is gonna be done. And uh, there is no right or wrong. Um, I, we got a lot of questions for like, how much memory do I have? Or how, how much memory do I need? Or how, what kind of CPU? Really get the CPU you can afford. What is available to you, okay? Next, most important thing that you need to spend money on as an effects artist is memory. So 32 to 64 gigabytes of memory does not have to be the latest DDR4, does not have to be 3000 gigahertz. I still have 12 years workstations that I use and they, they have enough memory and I just let them run and the sim finishes no problem. You just have to be patient. So patience is the key and you can still use older hardware as long as they have enough memory. So I know DDR3, for example, is very, very cheap. Now you can get something on eBay with 64 gigabytes for like 300 or $400. I was going to ask you about rendering. Um, yep. You did mention Mantra and Karma there. Um, interestingly, Karma is actually... Side effects as Houdini's brand new renderer. Absolutely. Maybe people yeah. might not be familiar with the fact that there's two renderers, you know, inside Houdini effectively. Maybe yeah. you could quickly mention that. Yeah, of course. So this majority, 90% of these effects were rendered in Karma. And uh, uh, it's almost production ready, I'd say. Give it a try, test it, see how, how, how it goes. But basically, Houdini now ships with two things. It ships with Mantra, which works in the uh, classic workflow using the ROP output context. And then you have Karma, which is a USD. Um, uh, uh, it supports USD, basically. It works with mm. USD only. And it, it's integrated in what's called now Solaris or LOPS. So if you need to use Karma, you have to adopt this new workflow that uses USD, which is very, very interesting. And it offers so many uh, features and so many improved workflows to compare to the classic one by default. And then you will have access to Karma. And uh, it it's much faster than Mantra in many, many cases. So it really is up to us to test it and explore what it's capable of and start using it. But I think SideFX did an amazing job with this. They also offer GPU. So it, it supports rendering on CPU and GPU. And I know a lot of people are interested in GPU rendering. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to that, mainly speed. And so definitely try it out. It's The GPU implementation is still in alpha, but it has uh, a lot of potential to be production ready very, very soon. Yeah, so yeah th those are the some of the tools that we're going to clarify. And that's the other thing. Like, you have the, all these options, which path I'm going to go? What is the best workflow for me to get my effects done, my shot done? So we're going to try and provide all this guidance to help students and users navigate through all these hoops and the, <laughs> what works and how they work and how that can be used, right? So we're going to do our best to help yeah. provide guidance there. I and I think, say, but the other thing that you are really showing well here is that 
As a Houdini artist, you can jump in Houdi- into Houdini and complete shots just, you know, as an individual. But Houdini is often and, you know, a central part of the pipeline of these big animation and visual effects studios now. And that's why Side Effects has adopted things like Pixar's USD format, um, you know, and made sort of rendering and, and the pipeline a lot easier, isn't it? But yeah. but it, it's interesting. Houdini is absolutely something that an individual can jump in and do amazing work, but it also forms part of a bigger pipeline. Absolutely. So Houdini can totally replace and offer the same functionality as any uh, a- the other lighting applications like Katana or Maya or uh, Gorilla Render or other, you know, standalone lighting applications. And uh, I think Side Effects did an amazing job. And they also offer a cheaper license. If, so if you have a team of 10 lighters, you can get a mm. cheaper version of Houdini that is focused on lighting only. Basically, it does not include DOPs and it only includes SOPs and ROPs. So you can use it to gather all your assets, shade and light um, in Houdini. And I think it's 100% viable workflow. If, if I was starting a studio, that would be the main workflow um, uh, that I would go with. And then with, with Karma or Solaris workflow that they offer, because it's USD native, you can use it with Arnold and uh, I think very soon Redshift as well. So you can have these, what they call USD delegate, where you the data is still the same. And then you feed it into these various third-party renders and it would just work. And so I think that is very, very powerful. And I think SideFX is definitely doing an amazing job there. All right. So let's talk more about this effects workflow. So what we, we talk about effects. What is it? How does it look like in production? What is it that we we do? So if you are an effects artist, you will get, uh, you will be using Houdini. You will get data from other departments, mainly the animation department, who will give you a, a character or, you know, a camera and some ships falling or something like that. You will take that data, ingest it in Houdini, process it to, let's say, emit smoke or emit smoke and have the character run through it. And then you render those effects and provide those renders to compositing. That is the typical effects workflow. You're not uh, you're not gonna be required to render the entire shot. You will only render your effects. So in this case, I have a, a King Kong uh, attacking a helicopter. So there's all the smoke effects and then the effects is being rendered, let's say, in, in Mantra, and then that compos- gets composited over uh, the final render, which are coming from Maya or Katana or another place. So this is the typical workflow for a visual effects studio. Other places will go as far as rendering the entire shot in Houdini, and that is also a, a common thing to, to see. This is a second uh, example of you bring in data from other application. In this case, it's created in Houdini, but most most of the time it's not. So you import the animation, you you prep it in SOPs, you emit smoke from it, and then feed that in DOPs to create the render. And this is what you render and pass into compositing. So this is the typical effects workflow. So your task is really these two things: sim and render uh, in Houdini. And then if the uh, if the pipeline or the the studio requires uh, more rendering out of Karma or Mantra or Houdini, more lighting will be done then, and then the compositing will be done by another person. And then I want to talk about where this effects fits in into the CG workflow. So what, where does my work fit into the whole production pipeline? So we have modeling, we have shading and lighting, we have effect simulation, and then we have shading and rendering effects and then compositing. So really the part is here where you're gonna take the model and the character animation, use that to create the effect sim and render that. And then those renders will then be composited into the, the final shot. So this is, we fit in the middle of the production basically. We don't, uh, it's not a stopgap. They can still do the shot without the effects. And then when the, once the effects layer is ready, they overlay that and add it on top of the shot. And this is a, a, a render, it's just a preview of what the render looks like in Houdini, what the data looks like, how it looks in the final uh, frame. And this is a composite shot with uh, with some tweaks. Hey, but let me ask you a question yeah. that might suit people wanting to get into the industry. What, it, this is sort of a, a niche question. What do they tend to get called? Are they employed as effects artists? Is there something else you've seen around the place? FX artists, what, yeah. What it's so FX artist is the most common name, um, and the expectation will be 
for you to create effects in Houdini and render them out of Houdini. And you pass that data to other departments that will ingest your data and compose it into the shot. This is 80% of the of the job and of the title. In other cases, it's called effects TD or effects technical director, which will involve some scripting or some tool development, either using Python or VEX, basically prepping tools that will allow other effects artists to get create effects. So like a, a more of a development task. So other, you can find the job to be effects TD, but then that will require technical skills, not just artistic skills. You have to be technical with uh, writing code and developing uh, pipelines and tools and things like that. So that that's the that's the difference, I think. Great. All right. So what is Revelway goals with this workshop or in general? Now, Houdini, as I, as I explained, is is being hammered and used for effects. Every time you hear effects, you hear Houdini, but that's not the end of it. I want to push the limit. I want to push what our students can do. I want to push what Houdini can be used for and, and really show what it it's capable of. And my idea is to explore Houdini procedural modeling to as much as possible, as much as I can teach or as much as I can show without, you know, uh, without making it too much basically. And I wanna show in-depth procedural modeling in Houdini, which is something that started in the last four years, maybe five years, and now it's been uh, taken more and more seriously. So this is a preview of some of the models that we will, will provide with the workshop. These two are built in the environment as well as this one. Uh, actually, they're all built in the environment in the workshop except this one. So this is a procedural model of a sci-fi uh, environment with some pipes. This is the cave uh, environment. This is a, a building that is destruction ready. This is sci-fi blocks that we're going to build this environment with. And then here's some effects that are uh, done procedurally. And this is the cave and this is another environment. So I want to show what Houdini is capable of and what it can do in terms of modeling, not just effects. And this is just pushing the Houdini tools that are by default designed for effects to do something else. And uh, also I wanna cover as much as possible. So I wanna push doing modeling in Houdini, building environments in Houdini, prep them so that they can be used for effects later and also show how to shade and render in Houdini, which is something generally left. Like most, uh, all these images, they include environment. And I want to show how that environment can also be rendered, not just left for Maya or a lighter. I want to show my students how Houdini can be used to create that stuff. And so, yeah, I, I think it's very, very important to basically use Houdini as a full DCC, nothing else. We yeah. open Houdini, create the environment, create the camera animation, create the effects, render and composite if, if we have to. And that, that's, a, that's a really interesting point, Saber. And I think people um, might have already seen this, of course, but those incredible um, Matrix Awakens or the incredible yeah. Matrix Awakens yeah. experience that Unreal Engine Epic Games did uh, that's amazing. relied yeah. so heavily on Houdini for building the environments, right? Absolutely, 100%. So, and the other thing is we're, when I don't want to think of Houdini as just an effects tools, the more we know about Houdini, the better, because it can be used to solve other problems that are not cons being considered. Like that example, for example, Houdini is used to create buildings. And so the procedural aspect of Houdini, and because somebody knows Houdini really well, most likely as an effects artist, they've said, oh, I know I can solve that problem in Houdini. Let me spend some time on it. And they came up with a solution and said, this is the way to go. I think there's a potential because what side effects does is they just give us the tools and what we can do with them is up to us, right? Because they they don't know what we can do. We have to come yeah. up with the ideas and we have to come up with new solutions to problem uh, CG problems that are uh, that existed for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, so the other uh, one of Rebelway goals, or at least with this workshop, is I want to teach Houdini with all these capabilities. Like I said, I want to show... Uh, uh, what it can do for simulation, uh, water, uh, smoke, magical, destruction, abstract, and also kin effects, which is something very new. And uh, I think they, they started in 18.5 and it's very, very serious. So you can do proper uh, mocap and proper rigging and it's ready. Like I, I'm going to show some more examples here, but I, I really think there's a lot of potential. And at the same time, while uh, 
talking about Houdini, once we're done building whatever it is, I wanna show how to composite that stuff. And compositing can be done in Houdini. They have a, a COP network can be done in Houdini, can be done in Nuke, in Fission, or in After Effects or any other tools. There's no right or wrong. But here's the very important part that effects artist has to know. You need to know about compositing uh, a good deal because when you look at an effects or a problem that you have to solve, you need to think, what is it that I can produce in comp? What is it that I can only produce in Houdini? What is it that I can only produce in comp and how to combine both the best of those apps and save you time. For example, if you have some abstract effects, you can say, oh, I can create the glow in Houdini using some light and emit from that geometry, but you can also do it in comp, save you time. And uh, layering effects, for example, layering abstract effects, you have to think what Houdini, uh, what Nuke or uh, compositing softwares will allow you to do and what you need to provide in Houdini. I think understanding both of these workflows is very crucial to effects artists and uh, especially uh, beginners who are, or intermediate who are wanting to create a reel at the end that looks uh, pleasing, they have to understand uh, this aspect really, really well. All right, I'm gonna show just a quick break. I'm gonna show Students Reel from Rebel Way uh, 2019. And uh, I wanna talk about the creativity. So when we show a training in general, we try to offer as many possibility as we can for students to create unique art. I, I don't want them to just replicate what they see. I want them to come up with their own ideas. And this is a great collection of what students can create uh, and that is not exactly the workshop. So I can show you how to solve a problem and then you, use, you solve a different problem but using the same solution, create something unique to you. And uh, that is something I, we try to push really hard. And, and for this workshop, I'm just gonna push it even further. I'm gonna talk more about this uh, after these two videos, but I wanna show what our students are capable of doing uh, after a couple of workshops and after spending some time, you know, waiting for Sims and, and renders to be done. Uh, so this is a, it's a very cool one from 2019. Wow, that's amazing work. That would seem to fit on a, a pros showreel. It does, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a, a lot of them, if not all of them, are now full-time FX artists. Um, yeah, and they're probably seniors by now, you know. Um, so, yeah, we, we try to push our students really hard and help them create something unique, something high qual as of a high quality as possible. And... Uh, you know, teach them everything, teach them what we know and how we do it and how it should be done and guide them through the process. So that's uh, one from 2019, then 2019, 2021. Also, the, we've introduced, we've introduced more workshops, more topics so they can, um, you know, the assignments will be different. And uh, for example, I, I see students producing, you know, really nice shots, I message them, say, hey, look, let's work together. I can help you make it better. And I give them specific feedback. Even after the session is over or like the workshop is over, I can still work with them and try, uh, and we try our best to make them finish the shots and uh, make it look as cool as possible. So this is another one that has uh, more nuke, more compositing, more magical effects from 2021 because we're pushing that. There's also uh, real time, which is something very important and uh, there's a lot of uh, demand for effect, uh, real time effects artists. In fact, I think there is a, sh a massive shortage right now in effects artists in general, across the board, whether it's real time or offline, we are getting so many requests for studios wanting to hire effects um, artists. And so I think the demand is, is super high right now. And because of all the uh, Netflix and content creation is, the demand is just exploding for effects. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm hearing the same thing, of course. And um, it's that crossover between games and film, but actually using the game engines to do, you know, in combination with Houdini to do actual final frame film work. It's not absolutely. just for game stuff. Yeah, so. absolutely. So real time is is bleeding more and more into the offline pipeline. And Houdini... Mm 
when it comes to creating effects in Houdini, you either send them to Mantra or render them uh, offline, or you can feed them into Unreal Engine as long as it can handle the data. So you just have to figure out the workflow of how you take your effects from Houdini into Unreal. Uh, but then the effects process is still the same, right? Like you, you still make an effects in Houdini. You just have a different way of representing that data, and you have to figure out that workflow. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk more about uh, this workshop in procedural modeling or creation Houdini. And here I have a texture or an image of a pattern. And this pattern actually is created in Houdini using COPS. So this COPS is a, a compositing uh, uh, environment where you can do full shots. You composite full shots in it. And I'm using it in a different way to actually create geometry in Houdini. So I had to set up a system that, you know, talks to COPS, talks to compositing tools in Houdini and recreate that pattern as a geometry. And then that geometry is being used to create this procedural sci-fi system. And all of it is procedural, like 100% Houdini, it's all controllable, not a slider controllable, but there's a lot of flexibility here. And this is a, just a one way of how uh, I was saying, we are responsible to push and explore these things. What can we do with Houdini? What is what is it that we can create or how we can we solve a problem in a different way? And the more we show, the more we explore this, the better for everyone because side effect will look at this and say, okay, how about we push and spend some time developing a couple of features and improve that COPS workflow. And then we are able to create more patterns and more complex things. So this is just one thing. And then that data from COPS, the texture is fed into Houdini SOPS and is being used to create uh, the sci-fi uh, the block or sci-fi design that then is copied and uh, mirrored to create a corridor, a super complex corridor. So this is part of the workshop. And I'm gonna talk more about this in a bit, but it's very important to learn how to model and build environments, especially if you're aiming to get a job or build a reel that is unique. You knowing how to build environment is a crucial skill, especially if you make something look good. And I'm gonna talk more about this uh, in a bit, but I think I intend to show as much as possible. All right, so simulation for effects. Uh, this uh, section, I, I had to interject it. It does not fit exactly in the in the in the presentation but like i talked about points and voxels and geometry and all of this uh, all all of uh, all of that data can be run through sim you, so we can have a particle sim we can we can show a smoke sim we can show water we can uh, create cloth sim but that's not all we can connect solvers in an interesting way that is hard to visualize if you don't uh, use it, if you don't see it. So for example, when you think of a particle sim, it does not necessarily mean a particle sim. It can be a smoke sim, and then that smoke sim energy or velocity is used to affect particles. You can create a, a, a smoke sim and use that smoke sim to affect water sim. Uh, you can create a smoke, uh, a water sim, which is this effects here. You can create a floating water uh, ball, and it, it's a realistic sim, but then you represent that or use that force to affect particles. So this intertwined solving is crucial to push the limit of Houdini. And the more you know about these solvers, the more potential, the more ideas you can, uh, you can achieve and the more complex effects you can create. So this is something very unique to Houdini, I'd say. Uh, this is really... I am still learning. I'm still coming up with ideas all the time, like this uh, smoke effects. Uh, Igor started doing this, and then I pushed it even further, and now we have this super complex sim, uh, we'll show again in the end, that is done in a very, very efficient way, it's, it, but just because we're combining two solvers at the same time. And uh, here is also a, a water sim being rendered as particles. So intertwined solvers is a, a very complex idea, but it can lead to creating very unique effects. All right, so what is a student's goals? What is it that I look for uh, our student to achieve from this workshop or from learning with us, especially if they're a beginner, junior, or transitioning from uh, other softwares into Houdini? 
what is it that I want to see in the end? I want to see a demonstration. Uh, a, I want to see them demonstrate an in-depth understanding of all of these blocks, meaning all these aspects of Houdini, how to manipulate points, geometry, data, and either by showing multiple small examples or one large example that combines all of this. It also needs to convey their skills and creativity because that is a very important aspect when you're given to look dev or come up with a magical effects, you have to have a lot of creativity and art skills and you have to know Houdini in and out to be able to control and convert your ideas into images. And uh, I'm gonna help them through this workshop by providing multiple environments, multiple models, multiple ideas and assignments on how they can navigate. So what I mean by that is the, uh, we're gonna show uh, over the first three weeks how to build multiple different environments. So this is the uh, preview of some of the environments, or, sorry, the, all the environments pretty much that we're gonna show. And it's all done procedurally in Houdini. And while creating something useful, we are learning more and more about Houdini. It's not just about building the model. It's really about how Houdini works and how the data flows and how it can be used to create this. And uh, if we create three or four different environments, that's what I will show. The student will have a lot of possibilities on how they wanna go, how they wanna uh, create assignments. And it's like an RPG game, you know, you pick a hero and then you pick uh, the class and then you pick the weapons and you decide how you want to pursue the journey it's similar to that you pick the environment they say okay i'm going to build some uh, 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 abstract effects or i'm going to build some magical effects or i'm going to build something unique and i'm trying to provide as many uh, paths as possible so that the end result is always unique uh, per student it's not exactly the same and uh, this will also require them to be very, very creative. Like how would they use all of this data to create something that is unique, but that is part of the job, right? Like creativity is a very important aspect. And here I'm showing a full procedural uh, environment. And again, while building all these systems, we're learning more and more about SOPs. And the more you know about Houdini, just the better. There's no right or wrong, or there's no limit. Uh, and this is another environment, completely different art style. This is from a very old workshop that I rebuilt and uh, uh, optimized the scene that I'm going to be showing and providing. This is another uh, cave scene that is also built all procedural in Houdini, and the characters are running uh, in KineFX. These are some of the models that we have. They're all destruction ready. We're going to also offer this three different design, three different uh, ideas that can be used. This is a tunnel with some. Prometheus like uh, drone scanning effects. Uh, that's also another possibility. So really there's unlimited possibilities. And I'm gonna show this with the main goal to teach Houdini, but also how to use that those tools to build environments. And then the student task will be to understand that pick path and then start building and layering uh, ideas on top of that as we move forward. All right, so next is, uh, animation. So this is something new that adds into the RPG idea as well. And I thought, okay, maybe I can show or we can teach how to build environments, but I thought that's not unique enough. I want to push even further. So we are covering uh, kin effects. We're covering how to work with mocap and how to work with animation, how to get you know, uh, characters from online, purchase them or use Mixamo and build unique animation. This is some of the examples that I was able to create that I will teach. This is a simple run cycle. And just this by itself is, uh, you know, can be used to create a lot of a lot of effects. You can make them walk over a, a puddle of water. You can make them, uh, you know, being hit and they have lasers in the weapons. This is another animation cycle that was not included. Uh, I built a quick environment of a guy running and here the shooting is procedural. So like that, uh, uh, rippling effect is procedural. This is a, a, a crab walk from left to right, uh, from right to left of uh, a guy shooting. And the animation of the rifle is procedural as well as the effects. So to me, it's so important, so powerful. If I see a student saying, I built this in Houdini 100%. I got the character from online. It came with a rig and I put mixed in some mocap. 
I put in the rifle, I made the effects, and then that rifle is shooting some other glass and the, there's water behind the glass and the glass shot in the water is, is breaking and you know there's a massive flooding. To see all of that is really very powerful compared to somebody who just show me the water breaking. And uh, let me show this one more time. So here I'm also gonna cover how to do like secondary sims. So this is a build like a, a you know, um, what's called a, a, a tet mesh, a tetra mesh uh, that is jiggling. And that is being used to create the deformation or the animation of the backpack and all the weapons than anything that is hanging to make it feel more realistic. And then this is another uh, character uh, jumping down and um, recreating uh, some of the effects of Diablo. And I think the team and Chris Yang did an amazing job uh, creating this and they had a great presentation. So I'm gonna show how to redo a production ready effects and how to problem solve all of this. But then they can pick the animation, they can come up with ideas uh, and build their own animation. And then the main goal is now you have a environment, you have character, you have effects. What is more serious than that? Uh, as an effects artist. For me, that is like the highest achievement. If you say, oh, I know Houdini in and out, all of this is 100% done in Houdini, including compositing, then recorders and anybody who's looking into your stuff, they will take you very seriously compared to somebody else who's just doing effects. So that's something I, I really want to dive into and yeah. help students, help push students to create something unique. And then if you have control over animation and environment, the possibilities are endless, right? And yeah, and so I want to ask you about that. I, I think sometimes when people see these new Kinefix um, uh, capabilities in Houdini, they might think, oh, is this basically a replacement for working in Maya or Max or something like that? Do you want to talk about that a little bit in case people are thinking, oh, I can do everything in Houdini now? Absolutely. Side effects is doing an amazing job. And I think it's our job and duty to explore those tools, test them, do uh, the proper R&D to see if they can solve our production problem, right? Each studio has their own problem, but I think a lot of time in, in uh, R&D needs to be spent to see, okay, side effects, you've done an amazing job. Can you please add these couple of features? And then 19 point, you know, a five will come out, they will add those features and then it's all, it's taking more responsibility in the pipeline and it's serious now, like these tools, I think they're very important, but who is it, who is it, who is responsibility to show that they are production ready? I think it's us. We, we have to dive into this. We have to do the R and D. We have to show that they can be used and how they can be used. I think that's how I see it, and I, uh, we're spending a lot of time with KineFX. In fact, we're cre we we have a you know a, an artist, a freelancer, a really good freelancer who's spending a lot of time doing rigging, and hopefully we'll have a brand new class that everybody will like. And uh, we're going to see what we're capable of because it's an exploration phase for us. But yes, I think modeling is very serious now. We can replace a lot of parts of the pipeline. I mean, Houdini, uh, KineFX definitely we can replace a lot of things that Motion Builder can do with especially with PDG and automating uh, the the workflow of digesting mocap. I think a lot of game studios are using that already, but it's our job and, and duty to explore these tools and use them to solve problems that we face uh, every day. All right. So uh, another thing that I think is very important as part of creating a unique um, real or unique assignments is to uh, if you're serious about effects, you have to see as many as possible uh, of breakdowns, how those effects were done. Just looking at ILM breakdowns or like looking at demo reels, where you see passes, where you see effects, watch anything you can see as long as it's good from professional. Because the more you see, the more you know about how certain things were done. And uh, if you just know the solution to problems, even if you haven't implemented them, it's already a big step uh, towards acquiring those skills or acquiring problem solving skills. Because when you are faced with that problem, you say, oh, I've seen this somewhere. It, it's done being, it's been done that way. And that save you already 50% of the time, right? So I think the more you see about these breakdowns, the more you read about uh, Ian's uh, articles I, and effects guide and many other places, just 
read as much as possible about how things are done, how problems are being solved, how effects or VFX is being created. Um, I think that's very important for beginners to acquire the visual memory of what is it that we create and how uh, professionals do it mm. and solve it. I would give a special shout out. I mean, the, there's amazing breakdowns done by so many companies. Yep. I think some of the ones that are incredible relating to Houdini are from Rise FX in Germany because they, they yeah. really have an amazing big Houdini pipeline. Yeah. And Important Looking Pirates, who I'm Absolutely. sure you're very familiar with, because yeah. they they do these huge water sims, but the, also their lighting pipeline is completely Houdini. And so that's a really interesting perspective, Absolutely, I think, for students. Yeah. to, As you've mentioned, Houdini isn't just for effects sims. So yeah. it's really cool to see this other kind of work. Yeah. Yeah, those two studios are my favorite as well. Um, so, and then this journey that we're starting together, whether it's over the 10, 12 weeks or a year, as, as many time, as much time as you need, it, it's a long journey. It's not something that you're going to dip your toe into it and, and then all of a sudden you become an effects artist. It's, it's not a walk in the park. It's a serious uh, task. It's a, it requires a lot of attention. It requires a lot of dedication. And to get this team needed to start this journey, uh, you have to first work with your, yourself and learn how you learn. And this is something very unique uh, for each person. There's no right or wrong. There's no fast or slow. Just find the method that works for you. What I mean by that is some people will just watch the entire training or watch anything online, and then they think they know. They close. They are super confident. They think they know. That's not enough. You have to test. You have to see what is it that you've gotten from that video, and you have to practice. Sometimes, if you are at an advanced level, just seeing the solution will give you enough experience. You already know how to solve it. You can think of it in your brain, run it, execute it. It's, it works. You know it works. You know you can do it. But when you're a beginner or when you're starting, it's very important to find how you learn. With Houdini, for example, I recommend testing out, watching two hours, and then practicing. Or watching four hours, close the video, and then practice four hours or just find the rhythm where you can see knowledge and then absorb that knowledge and reapply it. It doesn't have to be unique at this level, just find the method that gets knowledge into your brain that stays, not things that you think you know or give you false confidence, things that you can execute without watching any other resources. Because if you have all these, and I, I get this many, many times, oh, I want to come back to this in three years and I acquire this uh, and I know this is there, it doesn't work like that. You have to acquire the knowledge in your brain because the more you store, the more problem, the better the problem solving skills become. Uh, this is a big topic, but it's about the brain and, and learning and how we learn and how we use that knowledge to problem solve later, right? So if you're, let's say, if, if you're a detective and you have this, uh, uh, mystery or you get this letter that you need to decipher. There's two detectives, one who knows a lot of history and they have read so many things about uh, anaglyphs and uh, Egyptian and typography and, and they know so many things. They look at that, boom, they have the solution. The other detective have no clue what the solution is. And so when you look at the detective number one who read so much about history and, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, writing and, and unrelated things to detective, you would say, oh, he's watching, he's learning something that doesn't serve him anything. It's not the case. So that that's how I see it in Houdini. You have to learn as much as possible. Don't defer things because deferred things are not being used in the brain to problem solve things. The brain can only solve problems with things that you have. So for example, I made a custom grooming system in Houdini uh, and I also made a custom grooming system that use a particle sim. So you can groom hair by running a particle sim to direct and create the hair strands and how they curl and how it works, right? So I made this not because I know Houdini, but because I know grooming in and out. And if you say, oh, I'm gonna defer learning grooming to another never, you know, you're never gonna have those problem solving skills. So the more you learn, the better.
Um, and, and I think it's very, very important, especially in the beginning, to know as much as possible because that will build confidence that will give you, uh, if you start solving problems that will develop, uh, that will give you more confidence and make you a better artist. If you are very confident, you can learn faster. This is like a psychological thing. If, you are, if you're confident that you're going to win, you will win. So I think it's crucial for students to you know, be prepped uh, mentally and, and physically for this journey and not say, oh, I'm too lazy. I, I don't like VEX or I don't like this. Just do it, you know, learn and, and do the work. And then eventually you will feel that you are a much, much better artist. And the amount of knowledge and growth that you have will just be exponential. That's the curve, right? Like you will start very hard, but then it will spike very quickly. Yeah. And you realize like, oh, I know, like I know so many things now in just a, a span of a year. And, um, uh, it, it's such great advice, Sabo. I, I, to, to, to jump on that a little bit, I would say out there, there might be a, a, a misconception that Houdini is very hard to learn. But when I do talk to students and experienced Houdini artists, what they say almost echoes what you were, were just mentioning there, which is if you jump in and learn the basics and learn parts of Houdini, yeah. you really start picking it up as a whole. Is that, I mean, it is complex software. Let's not say it's not, but it is about sort of learning it, you know, bit by bit, isn't it? Yeah, so absolutely, absolutely. You you have to you have to start picking at it bit by bit and uh, uh, you have to define what is hard, right? What What is hard to you? What does hard mean? Because if you climb... A mountain or a hill say that's hard other people climbed uh, Everest so what is hard what does hard mean what is your definition and I had a uh, I worked with a, a brilliant uh, developer at, uh, at Blizzard his name is Pete Chenners. he gave me this advice and said I was problem solving things in Python he said if you can't explain it then it's hard if something is you can't explain then that thing is hard like it's it, and you're probably doing it the wrong the, the wrong way. So if you can't explain something to somebody else, what you're doing is is really hard and probably the wrong way. And I've taught so many students Houdini, hundreds, and I can tell you it's not hard. You just have to know how to explain and how to teach, how to demystify things. You know how how to make it easy so that people get can get into and. Uh, uh, this is another very important aspect, how to build confidence that you can learn. Because if you start with Houdini hard, I'm not going to learn, I'm going to fail, you're going to fail. No, no, don't worry about it. You're going to fail really hard. But if somebody gives you the right advice, start small, take small bites, make exercises, don't forget that you're using Houdini, just create a plane, add some noise, make some movement, go have a walk. Come back the next day, try something harder. Building that small confidence, you will eventually build enough confidence to just start the app and, and not get, you know, that uh, that fear that a lot of people get when they see the Houdini tab menu or whatever uh, that scares them. Oh, like, I have to learn all of this. No, don't learn all of this. Like, just start slow. And I can tell you that after two years or like three years of full-time practicing, depending on how your memory is, you get to a point where you know Houdini in and out that you can start running Houdini in your brain. You can start problem solving. Oh, you see this problem. You can start building networks and you come up with solutions. <laughs> and a lot of things that I've solved are actually not in Houdini. I solved them while I'm not in Houdini. Mm. And uh, yeah, this is like weird thing where you sleep with a problem and you, okay, you wake up with a solution because all the tools are in your subconscious and your brain is still working because we love problems, right? Like everything yeah. is a problem. So uh, after a certain period of time, you will just get to a point where you are running Houdini in your brain because all of these nodes make sense. They are all connected in a meaningful way. Like it's a puzzle. It's not some magic weird way that they operate. It's They're made by a person, you know, who's as a super smart uh, developer making a tools that actually work. They're not we're, they're not trying to make your life hard. But I think that the hardest part is because we want so much control, 
that we have access to so much data and so many features that makes it hard. For example, Maya has the same amount of data in Houdini, uh, but it's because it's hidden, people think that it's easy, but it's the same data, CG is CG, right? And uh, uh, it, it's just the way it's being represented because side effects in Houdini is uh, opening up all of this. You have access to point, normals, velocity, and you can change all of it. I think that makes things feel harder, but eventually they're gonna make you a much more powerful uh, artist and, and be able to control all this data that we talked about. Yeah. Um, it is right. also important to pick a task, right? That is realistic, but also challenging. Like how much weight can you lift? Today you can lift 20, maybe next day or in a week, try 25, you know, try push, but don't go 50, right? Don't do a storm or a flooding of, you know, hundred kilometer scale. Just don't do that. Try pick something that is realistic that can be done. Um, so, yeah, and, and then I want to talk about the story. I think this workshop is really the foundation of Webway and the foundation of the learning path. Um, I'm going to talk briefly when I started and how I thought about this. So uh, about seven years ago or so, the land, the teaching land was really bad. Like it, it's very hard to get into Houdini. It's very hard to learn. And uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't find a decent resource. So I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to make that resource. I'm going to make the best Houdini training that if you take it, it's going to push the fear away. It's going to help you build models, going to help you get you to that point. And since then I did it, it worked, and it's been the foundational step for our learning path and getting people into the VFX industry or the FX industry. And I've done this workshop for six years now, so many, so many times. And I've gotten many artists who landed job just by finishing this properly. Like one entire workshop, you finish this, you dive into it, you can get to the point that it is required or the skills that you need to land a job. And so that is my main goal. I wanted to offer people like the entire guidance. Don't, if you join or do this, stop watching YouTube. Like don't, distract yourself don't do anything just do this focus on it and don't waste time on anything else once you finish this you can start spawning off and and do other things and uh, <clears throat> this workshop uh, fits exactly with our learning path so learning path so we have many workshops we have the houdini fundamentals which is a step below this and it is really intended for pure beginners. They have never done CG. They've never done effects. They don't know much. They want to get the foundational steps just to build that confidence. Then we have this big effects workshop that tackles everything, water, uh, destruction, pyro, and magical, and really get you to a level where you're comfortable with Houdini. And then we have the next level, which is the more advanced specialized workshops. And that will be like a, a whole other year or two years of learning. Um, and then with this, I want to provide, every time I provide guidance and assignment and try to push students to create something unique. And that is the whole methodology behind this. Like, I want to help them build environments. I want to help them create animation. I want to help them create something unique so that by the end, if you present a reel that has all of these plus effects and it looks decent, then you have a much higher chance of landing a job. And you'll probably know Houdini really well. And um, and uh, forgot. And, and the other thing I wanted to mention is there's so many things now on YouTube. Like six years ago, there's not so many YouTube resources or like free training. But now the problem is, um, how do you learn, right? If you go into a library, there's probably enough knowledge to become a mathematician, a physician, and a doctor. But how do you go about it, right? It's all free, but how do you go about it? How do you do it? And so that guidance and that journey is, is very crucial. So, and having free knowledge does not mean necessarily mean you're gonna become that. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> I, I totally agree. <laughs> but that that's an interesting point, Saber. What mm -hmm. when someone's doing a Rebelway course, what sort of access do they have to the instructor? for asking questions and that sort of thing? Because I, I think that's what you're also getting at there a little bit. Absolutely. So we run uh, sessions and uh, basically we have weekly uh, release. We release about three to four hours of content 
and uh, each week there's an assignment they have to study create an assignment and throughout that week we have uh, they submit an assignment we provide feedback and review but the difference is we have a 24-7 Discord channel. Uh, we have a full team of what we call effects DA, basically effects artist, technical assistant, and they help answer any questions you may have. And then I'm also available to provide further clarification that effects DAs cannot answer. So we try to provide guidance and help throughout the frustration journey. As you learn, you're going to get frustrated, run into many problems. And so having a what we call an FX DA or somebody to support you uh, with those issues very, very quickly is very important to get you going and uh, and working. And then you submit the assignment and uh, I, I we look at them and I look at them and then we provide feedback. And if I see like an issue or if I see a common problem that is across multiple assignments, I will record extra video or show extra solution how to, you know, how to avoid that or how to solve that problem. And it's very interactive. So especially the first session, uh, I try to uh, be very active uh, in it and and see how students are doing as we go. And if they say, oh, we want more effects or I wish we could, you could show us how to achieve this or solve this problem, I would go in and, and help them uh, with that. And Basically, that's how we operate. That's how all the workshops are. They're all, uh, they're all big. They're all very serious. It's not, you know, it's not a walk in the park. So you have, you get assignments. You have to sim. You have to study. You have to practice and tweak. And then uh, we're here to help with the journey. And then with the, especially with this one, we're going to offer uh, multiple HIP file documented HIP files. We're going to offer all these environments, and then. I will help as much as I can to push them to create something unique. And, and that is really uh, what I'm hoping for. Awesome. Great. Yeah, this is uh, our demo reel from 2021, at the end of 2021. And uh, we're adding more workshops and we're working with uh, on in, with many artists. Hopefully it's, it's really a long process to create content, especially at this scale, you know, to cover 10 to 12 weeks. And uh, we're trying our best to create uh, more and more workshops. And something else I want to mention is that our workshops, we in our workshops, we try to, th there's two goals, right? There's one workshop designed to help uh, students either learn Houdini or get into Houdini and become an effects artist, or they are already an effects artist and they want to solve a specific problem, let's say a flood or a whale jump or a large scale nuclear explosion. Because we're an effects, we are effects artists, we spend time developing production ready solutions that we share. So this is what we've done. This is how we could have solved this this is how we could solve that problem and then as a studio or as a lead you take that you look at it and say okay Rebelway team did it this way it's great that saved me six months of r d or like five months of r d so the especially the advanced workshops are really geared towards studios who are wanting to get effects done faster and save time on problem solving it could have been that our solution is not is not great in the first place in your use case but at least you saw it and you can see how it could fail in your case. So you just you know, uh, uh, avoid that path all and save time. So e either it works for you or not, it will save you time. And that is the more advanced workshops. Uh, Igor is doing one like with Ocean Effects. He's been doing so much R&D to basically figure out like the production work, uh, ready workflow for Ocean Effects, you know, large scale Ocean Effects, large scale uh, effects. And and then when we present this, it affects studios will say, okay, we can uh, probably watch that uh, and and see how they did it, learn from it, and then either take that same path, improve it, or not take it at all. We want to try something else. So that's uh, really the two workshops or the two types uh, we have: either pure educational, where we go over a lot of things and try to get people to become effects artists, and or uh, problem solving in, in production. So say, but that was great to get that impressive extended overview of what you'll be talking about in the course, but also just generally, you know, getting a grasp on what Houdini can do. Um, there are some people here that have asked some questions and I thought a lot of them were really great. So I thought we'd go through some of them. That's okay with you. Sure. Absolutely. 
But one of them is a very general question about the Houdini to Arnold pipeline and whether that's now a standard thing in FX studios. Um, they use Redshift and they're wondering if learning Arnold is necessary. You talked about this a little bit, but um, tell me about that. Right. I think all these uh, f uh, physically plausible renders are all similar, V-Ray, Redshift, and Arnold. And mm. I think just having a base understanding of what a physical base render, how it looks and how it works and the type of materials you have access to, I think there's a standardized way now to build like the BRDFs uh, between them. So learning Redshift uh, is perfectly fine. But then uh, knowing Arnold, which shouldn't be too hard to transition over once you get access to it, I think it's all applicable. You just have to find how that tool works in DUI and things like that. And uh, um, again, you're going to go, if you learn Redshift, right, and then you apply for a job and they use Karma, or Mantra, or Arnold, you can say, oh, like, I can do the job, right? You, you have to be adaptable and just go for it. Uh, but whatever is available to you, whatever can help you create the shot and get the work done, either for your real or for your commercial, use that tool, whatever is available at your disposal. There's no right or wrong. Uh, I, I use Arnold uh, mainly because I use CPU. I don't use GPU and uh, CPUs because I do effects and pretty much all effects are in CPU. So that's really what I ha I'm set up for. But yeah, I've seen, I've implemented Redshift. I helped implement Redshift at Blizzard. We've done so much R&D. It's a great uh, render to use. And uh, yeah, I think it should be easy to transition to Arnold. Awesome. A, a bit of a different question here. This one's from Andrew, sure. who asks, any advice on starting or creating a portfolio um, what makes a good portfolio and what's useful to include? Obviously, I think he means in terms of Houdini FX work. Right. So uh, w when it comes to recruiters, you're going to send in your reel and they're going to look at it. And based on how good it is compared to whatever what other submissions they got that day, you're going to either make it through the cut to be presented to the FX lead or not. And so really, and, and I think you can, custom you can customize and build reels for studios specific studios let's say you you are in that region and this is in general in fact not just for this you build the reel based on the studio you want to land the job at so let's say you are in london who is available who's nearby you are in 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 france who's nearby what type of work they do commercial uh, commercials or cinematic there's not so much film for example you build a reel that fits their portfolio fits the work so you aim at that there's no global uh, reel that can hit all the targets you have to focus what is your target is it commercial is it game is it film and i think film in general is a bit harder because the requirement and the skills are much uh, harder for film I, even as a junior i think uh, a commercial are much easier to get into a TV show, you know, less requirement and uh, you can, you can get there uh, easily. And then once you are in, uh, you will progress much faster in terms of portfolio. I think for me, what I look for, does this person know Houdini really well? Number one, does this person know problem solving? Number two, and do they have, do they present an artistic skill? or not, like how creative they are. And that is up to the artist, not up to me to demonstrate. You have to show me those skills, whatever they are. You know, it's interesting. So yes, putting together a portfolio to, to get a job at a studio or to, to score a gig is, is obviously a huge part of being a visual effects artist. But there is also this distinction, I think, currently with the demand for Houdini artists in terms of working in a studio versus being a sort of dedicated freelancer. And Kenny has a question, how do you establish yourself as a freelancer? Again, I'm guessing in Houdini right. related work. Right, so what is a freelancer? What what level are you at? Are we talking a junior freelancer? Are we talking intermediate freelancer? Are we talking senior level? Are you, can, can you do like a flooding of a city if I give you the shot? Sure. Like, what is it? What is it that you want to promote yourself at? What are you capable of handling? Because effects, especially effects, it's not just about rendering. What can you do, right? Like, how heavy can we go? Um, can you do like an entire sequence of destruction or 
something like that. So really deciding what scale uh, you are able to handle and deliver is very important to start with. And then um, you, if there's two options, right? There is uh, remote freelancing. You They will give you access to uh, their workstation. You do all the work there. And that is basically a job that you're basically applying as a, as if you're working on them on site. There's no difference on site. You sim you're simply at home, but working for them. And then there's the other type where you take on the actual project, you deliver final frames. So deciding which path to go, what type of product you're gonna deliver at the end is important. Uh, and uh, both of them requires the full understanding of Houdini. So just learn Houdini as much as you can uh, and then see what type of jobs, what type of projects you wanna do I like this question from Jejun. How much time did Saber invest in <laughs> learning effect per day? Oh, I, can, I can't narrow out? it down. I can't narrow it down to per day, but I can still, no. I can tell you I'm still learning. Mm, mm. <laughs> I'm still learning every day. And as I open Houdini and I try to learn every day. So uh, it does not stop. There's no part where I say, oh, I'm now starting learning. And today, oh, I stopped learning. It's not like that. You are always learning. And I think the day you say I stopped learning is when you actually start progressing. So there's no on and off state. It's always, a, you know, a, a acquiring more knowledge. And uh, if it's something you like, if it's something you really like, you're probably going to spend a lot of time like I did. Mm -hmm. I spent so much time. I, I, this is my hobby. This is what I do for fun. So it's, it, it's a lot of time. I, I, I don't have a number, but it's a lot. <laughs> that that's a totally perfect answer i think um this is a question that i think you've also addressed a little bit in the way that you learn houdini this question comes from impulsive toaster must be their username yeah. and they're talking about specialization it's actually a question that comes up a lot in general visual effects absolutely you know getting a job do you just try and learn how to do an explosion or a water sim or do you try and right. focus in on other things? What right. do you think so, about that? Right. So uh, the person, the artist who does explosion and the artist who does water effects, they're one thing in common between them. They both know Houdini really well. And so... Right. And so <laughs> I get it. Yeah. So know yeah. Houdini really well. And then you can specialize, but before you, you can say, I'm going to learn Houdini for destruction. You can say, I'm going to learn Houdini for water, because I just showed that it's a complicated topic, but I showed that, that intertwined solving system where you can use other tools that are me not meant for destruction or explosion to be used in water. You can use them for particles. You, you, so it's not one off. One, you have to acquire a, a solid understanding in Houdini, and then you can specialize. But they all have a really good understanding of how Houdini works. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Igor, for example, specializes in water, but he does pretty much any, everything else, right? Uh, I can do water, but I also do destruction and explosion same way. So it's not, um, it's not one thing. However, there's one thing you can specialize in, which is art. So you can say... I specialize not in technical terms, but you can say I specialize in abstract effects, I create magical effects. I can represent, you can give me a, an idea and it can come, come up with a concept to you. I specialize in that stuff. So that creativity you can specialize in, but this is really like, again, all these uh, artists, they know Houdini in and out. <laughs> so, yeah. No. Um, Another question, I guess, this is all about getting a job in some ways, some of these questions. Sure. Eugene Ray um, says, is it helpful to have breakdowns in your oh. portfolio, you know, demo video? Right. Or should you really just show people your shots, your finished shots? I will give an advice that works for everyone. Show me something that you're proud of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you've done this effects, that you've done it in a very intricate way, that you're my, you got my brain puzzled. Oh, like how they actually did that. Show me the breakdown that you peak because you piqued my curiosity, right? But if you have a building that is falling, there's not much there to show in terms of layers, right? 
Um, it's it, for FX artists. It's really to also demonstrate skills. It's not to show me, you know, the layers. I really don't care. But if you are building it in a very intricate way, like you have layers, you're subtracting something, you're adding something, and you're treating it in a very special way, and you broke it down in a um, in a unique way, and you problem solved it in a unique way. I want to see that. So really, show me something that you're proud of. Like, is it useful to me or not? So I think. That hope that helps. Yeah. In visual effects, Saber, people come to the industry from so many different ways. You know, they, they could be lawyers first or they could be um, illustrators, you know, or, or graphic designers. Nico here says, what are other important skills to have as an effects artist other Absolutely. than knowing Houdini? Absolutely. So I think the best skill, which to me is very important, is to be as good of generalist as you can. So knowing the whole process of modeling, shading, lighting, mm. whether in Houdini or other applications, Cinema 4D, Maya, just knowing the more you know about CG and the more ge the better generalist you are, the better effects artist uh, you're going to be. So just more um, non-effects related uh, fields or things that uh, I think will help overall. Great. Andrew has a question. What are some things you would like to have known before becoming a VFX artist? Uh, it's a very tricky question. It's a very tricky question. The only thing I can tell you I wish I've known is uh, if I have regret right now for something that I feel, for regret that I feel, I don't have a regret. Like I don't have mm -hmm. a regret for something I wish I would learned. Mm-hmm maybe dove more into math and like learn more about quadratic functions and how to learn to solve like more complex math problems. But that's just because I'm a nerd, you know, like I, I really wish to spend more time, but I did, like I did spend a lot of time on math and when I went to school and stuff, but uh, I, I can't say, Oh, like I felt that I missed that thing. Um, I don't have any, in, I think it's on a case by case basis, unfortunately. Yep. No, it totally makes sense. Well, Sable, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks to Absolutely. everyone for sending their questions. Your seminar and your overview was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And Thanks, um, I felt like I learned a lot that I wish I'd learned 10 years ago. So, <laughs> See, <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> um, I wish I'd yes. done this presentation 10 years ago. <laughs> Um, obviously, if you want to learn more about Intro to Houdini Effects, go ahead and click the link that's below the video, um, and you know you'll be able to read a lot more about Rebel Ways, th this course from Rebel Way, but also others. But um, thank you, Saber. That was a lot of fun. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ian. <laughs> Talk soon now. Bye. Awesome.